Welcome to Banana Bites. In this segment of the podcast, we go live on Data IQ's LinkedIn and Twitter every other week to talk to you about the latest in data science and AI. Our 15 minute bites are here to fuel your afternoon snack time with easy to digest food for thought. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for tuning in to Banana Bites. My name is Trevaney. And I'm Will. And we are the co-hosts of the Banana Data Podcast, which if you've heard, uh, welcome to the welcome to the live edition. And if you haven't, you should definitely check us out. We talk about a lot of fun data, AI, and beyond kinds of things. What did you say, Will? I would. But welcome, <laughs> everybody. Welcome. Good to see you. Great. So today we're going to kick off our bite with something I like to call a banana split, which is to say, here's an issue. It's up for debate, or a lot of people are talking about it in a couple different ways. Where do we, where do we see the debate, or how do we see the debate? Uh, so as you know, as we're growing uh, in the data science space and in the AI space, I'm seeing a lot more of my clients certainly moving to cloud computing, but also some holdouts from yep. bigger, bigger enterprises that say, absolutely not. We need to keep all of our work on prem where we control the servers and control the security of it. So for the split today, Will, what do you think? Is cloud computing the future? Is that where everyone will be going? Is it inevitable or is it, you know, something else? It's a great question. I think a great question to split on. And I guess uh, not to be that guy, but I'll preface my response and we'll probably get into this in this discussion with like, it's not, and doesn't need to be a black or white issue, but you know, folks like us on the internet want to make it into one. And it's true, realistically, more and more people are saying, hey, the strategy is not uh, gray, it's, it's one way or another. So with that in mind, I guess I would say, yes, I think the cloud is inevitable. And there's a few reasons why I think that. And like, obviously there are caveats and obviously there are stipulations, but I'm gonna go out on a limb and say, yeah, I think the cloud and like what we mean by the cloud, we'll get into, but I think the cloud's inevitable. It's coming, Trevaney. That's my take. <laughs> okay, cool. So it's gonna rain. It's gonna, sorry, what? <laughs> it's gonna rain. <laughs> yeah, it's gonna rain supreme. Uh, but, but to give you like some insight into why I think this, uh, for people listening now, I mean, on the Banana Data podcast, we talk a lot about, I'm not the only people that talk about this, but the data science or the AI or the analytics space uh, particularly in the applied arena of business, it's rapidly changing. It's rapidly evolving. No one knows what five years looks like. I would argue very few people really have a good sense of what things are going to look like in 12 to 18 months. So if I'm an organization that's plotting not just like my IT strategy, but ultimately my business strategy, and increasingly most businesses think that their broad business strategy should have kind of a, a tight tie-in with their data strategy, if I'm trying to project outwards, I just don't know. There's so many unknown variables. And I think, therefore, the cloud is superior. And why? Because I think like the underlying assumption here is that cloud computing, it's more uh, flexible or adaptable than on-prem. Uh, and so because of its flexibility, because of its adaptability, I, as a business leader, can say, I'm going to go to the cloud. And therefore, if next year uh, my resource demands are like five times what I expected, I can, I can live with that because I'm in the cloud and the cloud is more adaptable, more flexible. So what do you think? Valid or no? Well, I think it's, I think it's valid, but I don't think it's valid for everyone, mm -hmm. especially because when you think about the opposite side, right? To say, no, we're not going to the cloud. A lot of the holdouts are in industries and places where the data itself is really sensitive and needs to be secure. Um, and the compute even needs to be done in a place that is, secure from potential attacks, potential hackers, anything. So yeah, I could see people saying, well, cloud lets me be flexible, but perhaps that flexibility is actually worrisome for certain industries, certain orgs. Yeah, that's a great point. And for people like me who are praising the cloud for its flexibility, I think you're right that more conservative people, and I say that you know, with the utmost respect for a business that's being conservative with its customers' proprietary data, they they hear me say flexibility and they're like, we don't want, you know, nimble flexibility. We want right. rigorous, predictable performance. But then the flip side, I would say, is like, Trevaney, do you keep all of your money hidden under your bed at night? Well, if I tell you, then you're going to come rob me. 
Okay, fair enough. So <laughs> I, maybe we'll leave you aside. But for me, I do actually keep some money in banks. And so banks, I feel like, though the analogy is not perfect, are kind of the trusted third party that's uh, analogous here to the cloud providers. So my money is to uh, data what the bank is to the cloud providers. So I trust Bank of America. They say, hey, it's actually probably better that those experts worry about keeping my money secure and I don't like make a big fortress around my bed. Similarly, if I'm a huge bank XYZ and it's really important to me that I keep that data secure, which it is really important to keep that data secure, but instead of my having to pay year over year for a team of data security experts, isn't it just really attractive to say, hey, uh, Azure, I know you guys are doing that. Hey, Google Cloud, I know you guys are doing that. Hey, Amazon, I know you guys are doing that. I'm going to entrust you just like so many people across the world trust banks. Okay, so then let me ask you this. Do you think one of the reasons cloud is inevitable is because cloud is cheaper than on-prem? Ooh, that's a... You're asking the hard-hitting questions today, Trevaney. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, I'm sure listeners today, maybe people will ask specific questions on this. I, I don't want to come down one way or another, but just to give you my sense, and so this is there's probably follow-ups from you coming. Uh, again, I'm more with analogies for me today, right? It's like if I am thinking about summer, it's upcoming, and I want to go on a short little vacation, it's probably cheaper for me to spend a little bit of money and rent a vacation home for a week or a weekend than it is to say, okay, I'm gonna buy the whole thing. So similarly, if you're a company that needs some compute resources or some data storage resources, and you just need a little bit for a little bit of time, it's just like the vacation house. Um, just rent it, and so therefore the cloud's cheaper, but ultimately, if you're in something for the long run, again, I think the housing analogy is appropriate. So I would say it depends. Do you have a more uh, kind of certain answer there? Yeah, I I think I disagree with you, right? So your argument here is that Long-term cloud computing is more expensive than on-prem. And I actually disagree. I think at cloud computing long-term because of its flexibility oh, is okay. more like cost efficient yeah. for an enterprise because you know whether or not you plan to go on vacation every day of the year, which if you do, like what, tell me how you do yeah, that. Industry, yeah. yeah. Give me that hint. But I don't, I think that, organizations can be somewhat predictive and say, okay, we're expecting, you know, to onboard 10 new data scientists and they're all going to need access to their own GPUs or something. So we need to either build that or, or budget out for that cost. But I don't think most organizations know that, oh, three years from now, we'll be using 500 gigabytes of data every day or something. So in that sense, the cloud flexibility actually lets you be agile as things change, as the world changes, as your data changes, as your business grows, whatever it might be. And doing it in prem actually becomes a bigger headache down the line when you say, oh no, we've outgrown our on-prem. Now we need to scramble and figure out how to either enlarge it or quickly move to the cloud. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right. So we've got a couple good sides of the split here. Uh, another maybe question for you. So mm -hmm people talk about the cloud and some people think it's this mysterious thing, right? Like what we've discussed on, again, on the Dan Data podcast is the cloud is a set of resources, compute or storage primarily for data, though obviously there's like more, but you think of it as a set of servers that you access over the internet. Um, one like obvious example here, uh, and it's, it's, it's interesting too, like given the current circumstances is if I'm logging into AWS and either they have an outage on their side or like my internet is down. Well, if my internet's down and I'm relying on like some remote connection, then that's kind of problematic too, right? So if it's all on-prem, then I don't have to worry about like, oh, is AWS up today or not? I can just show up to the office and I know that my servers are there and they're good to go. So that's kind of another hidden wrinkle here. I don't know. I guess that's an argument in favor of on-prem. I don't know if you have thoughts on that, but well, I mean, well, well, look at where we're both sitting right now. We're not sitting on-prem and who knows when we will be. So yeah. being flexible in that sense is important. Um, and I think, I think your security, your concerns about security and sort of, you know, the internet's down or, you know, there's some sort of DNS attack happening on mm -hmm. our server that that's a, a valid concern, but 
going back to what you said earlier, I think we should trust certain experts to handle that yeah. and focus on what we know how to do well. Yeah. I mean, uh, one thing that's uh, also kind of an interesting wrinkle that occurs to me here that is, uh, I don't know if either of us are necessarily experts in things like antitrust and, and economics, but if you think about like what a natural monopoly is or kind of what a monopolistic organization is, like these cloud vendors have acquired masses and masses of server farms. Like if you and I want to go procure some huge GPU server, that's hard for us to do. Whereas at this point, like for me to just go rent a small portion of a GPU server for a small portion of time, like the marginal costs there are small. So another analogy that's occurring to me in my mind is like that of the power. So you're talking about, yeah, it's inconvenient if the internet goes out uh, and you lose access to AWS. Similarly, like it's inconvenient for me when a storm hits and my power goes out overnight. But again, that's like, there are pros and cons and electricity provision. It's just something that's like more naturally inclined to a large organization like the electric utilities in my neighborhood, right? It doesn't make sense. I don't go out and like talk to 10 different people on the street and say, which one of you is going to give me my electricity today? Or should I provide my own electricity today? Yeah. Uh, solar and wind power aside. Um, but in general, we're saying like electricity is this big thing that I can't optimize myself. Sometimes it goes out and that sucks. But in general, I'm going to go to the electricity utility and I'm going to rely on them. And ultimately, that's going to be kind of in my best interest, uh, I think. And I would love anyone on the line now or, you know, feel free to contact us later and kind of critique or support this idea. Like, how are the cloud vendors analogous or not to people who are selling me electricity? I see a lot of comparisons right. there. Is it a utility? Is Internet a utility? That's a whole nother debate. Yeah. So actually, there are some uh, interesting comments coming in uh, via LinkedIn and Twitter. So. Uh, someone rightly is pointing out that private cloud storage and public cloud storage strategies are going to be different when you're talking about cloud computing. But I think I think we should clarify that when we say on-prem, we're still saying it's your cloud that you own or you you own the servers, you own the infrastructure and the data centers, but maybe your um, your your employees are connecting via an intra intranet or um, sort of some special tunneling access that your enterprise controls versus public cloud where you're not in charge of like, will your analogy, the electricity or whatever it is, and you're letting someone else handle it. Yeah, no, I think that's exactly right. I think that like private cloud has lots of benefits, but for the distinction, I think it's really important here, like correct me if this isn't what you're saying, but that people think of private and public cloud differently. Like some of the big cloud vendors provide private cloud where they'll come on-prem to your business and set up like scalable or elastic infrastructure. Uh, and that's great. But I think in general here, let's think of, I would like group private cloud with on-prem and then keep public cloud uh, on the other side of the debate. Absolutely. Uh, so an interesting question here from Robert, what is the difference between cloud storage and cloud computing? You want to take that one or you want me to, I think you, you go for it. All you, right, sure. I'll see well, if I, I mean, can add or at all. Cloud storage is, any sort of database that lives on on the cloud, whether that's your cloud, private, or publicly owned by AWS or Google or whoever. So the storage, the database, um, whether it's SQL, NoSQL, S3, HDFS, which is, you know, I, actually that is a file system. But anyway, regardless on what the the type is, that's just the storage. That's just where your data is. Cloud computing is saying, we're going to send all of the actual computational work to happen in the cloud. Instead of downloading that data onto my laptop and then typing out my code and whatever, I'm actually going to send code to the data and let it execute either in the database or using a different computation engine that doesn't live locally. Cool. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. And I guess another thing to keep in mind, like this is now moving beyond like the pros and the cons of the cloud and on-prem uh, but just for people listening in, right, if you're thinking about your go to cloud strategy, if that's a thing, um, like one of the big hurdles practically that people in technology face now, uh, which is interesting, is just uh, even though like we're talking over the Internet at the moment, Internet's quite snappy. Oftentimes that's the bottleneck. So another way in which this could be a con of going to the cloud 
is that cloud vendors might say, store your data with us. It's very cheap to use cloud storage. Maybe it's more expensive to use cloud compute, but the benefit of doing everything in the cloud is that your data lives with them, your compute lives with them, and the transfer of the data, the latency is close to none. Whereas if I'm saying, oh, the, the data lives in the cloud, and I want to pull it down to my laptop, do some stuff on my laptop, and then push it back up, uh, that network transfer is oftentimes kind of the big hiccup. So yeah. uh, obviously you get into the weeds like this, it gets even more complicated, which is probably not surprising to anyone. Yeah. Well, great. Thanks so much for, for chatting. Well, I think that's about all the time we have right now uh, for this bite. But if you're interested in hearing more about what Will and I talk about, you should check out the Banana Data podcast. Uh, we go a little bananas on it and you can find it wherever you subscribe to podcasts. So thanks so much for hanging out, Will. And thank you all for joining in. Yeah, have a great day, Tiffany. Great. See you next time. And that's all we have for our Banana Bites today. To catch our live segments, follow Data IQ on LinkedIn or Twitter for bi-weekly live streams. 